Good morning and welcome to day two of our second Real Estate Live UK in 2021. Our weeks of free to attend virtual events run three times a year in February, June and October and the programme is brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors. And I'd like to offer a particular thank you to U Capital who are partnering with our London keynote that's about to take place. During the sessions this week, places across the UK are showcasing investment opportunities and industry leading experts from the public and private sectors will be discussing new ideas and topical issues relating to property. You can view the full programme on our website, realestatelive.co.uk, and I'll let you know about what else is coming up today at the end of this session. And before we begin our London keynote, I'd just like to remind you that the audience there to please ask questions in Zoom's Q&A feature, and our chair will be um, coming to those later on in the discussion. And now I'm really pleased to hand over to our chair for this conversation, Nick Bowes, Chief Executive of Centre for London. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Bonnie said, I'm the Chief Executive of Centre for London. Uh, this is only week three for me in this job, uh, which I think still allows me to uh, say that I'm new, uh, but I'm not new to London and London policy issues. So I'm really looking forward to today's session, which is uh, entitled Keeping London on a Level, uh, which is in partnership with U Capital. We have a first rate panel with us today. Uh, I'm very quickly going to run through our panelists uh, before I hand over to them uh, for their contributions. Uh, and I'll just go through them in the order that they are going to be speaking this morning. So firstly, we have Jules Pipe, and Jules is the Deputy Mayor uh, for Planning, Regeneration and Skills at City Hall. And he's been working at City Hall since uh, 2016. And prior to that, he was the first ever uh, directly elected mayor of Hackney between 2002 and 2016. Definitely. We're also joined by uh, Lloyd Lee. Lloyd is the managing partner at U Capital Management. And Lloyd has a, a background of over two decades in real estate uh, uh, and property uh, and Lloyd is joining us from U Capital who are our partners for today's event. We're also joined by Tony Travers, Professor Tony Travers, who's the director of LSE London. Tony's a widely known and well-recognized commentator on all London policy and political matters um, uh, and uh, uh, ought to really be the Professor of London, if he had a proper job title. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Ros Morgan. And since 2016, Ros has been the Chief Executive of the Heart of London Business Alliance. Uh, and that covers many of the most high profile parts of central London, including Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus, St. James's and St. Martin's in the West End. And we're also joined by Councillor Darren Rodwell, Darren uh, was first elected a councillor in the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham back in 2010, and he became leader of the local authority in 2014. Uh, and anyone who's ever had the privilege of meeting Darren knows that he's very passionate about his borough and for the regeneration and growth potential uh, for his residents. So each of our panellists are going to speak and then we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. There's a Q&A function, as uh, Bonnie mentioned, uh, and I will be uh, trying to manage that at the same time as steer the discussion. But first of all, I'm going to hand over to Jules Pipe. And uh, Jules, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what the GLA's plans are to ensure that London remains on a level. Jules. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, well, levelling up versus levelling down, I think, seems to be the discussion about how we maintain uh, London's uh, position uh, globally, really, as a, you know, the most successful global um, world city. You know, a lot of the talk uh, about the levelling up agenda for, for the country has uh, inevitably led to discussions about levelling down and we think uh, of London and, and we think this is a big mistake. Um, it's a worrying trend. It should be a real concern for all of us who are not interested, um, you know, just in, in the growth and recovery our cap of our capital city, but of the country as a whole. Uh, London clearly plays a vital role um, uh, um, in, in our uh, national life and will do so in our national uh, recovery, helping to level up regions right across the country. Um, you know, our local economies, uh, the cities, regions, you know, we don't exist in isolation. 
We're bound together by supply chains, complex web of social and, and commercial ties. Um, you know, I mean, a, a common example we talk about, say, just like the buses, you know, our target of making all London's buses zero emission by 2030 um, means that London has placed um, orders uh, with companies in Scarborough, Falkirk, uh, Ballymena over in, in, in Ireland. Um, and all of this is helping to create high quality jobs and boosting local economies uh, across uh, the country. You know, TfL supply chain alone generates more than two billion pounds uh, outside uh, the capital. Um, and I, you know, I I don't say though, you know, give those examples in any kind of you know uh, paternalistic trickle down kind of way. Uh, the relationship between London and the rest of the country and all parts of the country with each other is symbiotic. Um, we we rely on, on each other uh, to make this this country work. Um, but I do have to add that you know for many years London's contributed contributed far more in taxes than it receives in government spending um, here in the capital. Um, in 2019, we provided the government with nine forty billion pounds more in tax revenues than was actually spent um, within our city. Um, so I think it's absolutely crucial that. You know, levelling up our towns and cities across the country shouldn't be seen as a zero sum game and and meaning that that London gets gets levelled down. Uh, It's not a choice between investing in London or the rest of the UK. Um, It's not about competition. It's more about partners and it's in no one's interests um, uh, uh, to to, to level London down. And where London succeeds, the rest of the UK uh, will succeed as well. Um, We've also got to remember that uh, you know, there's still a massive job to do to level up within our cities, um, as well as between our regions. Um, there are serious economic and health inequalities uh, in London. They've been getting worse over uh, the last decade, um, and the pandemic just exposed and exacerbated um, those those inequalities. Um, you know, before COVID, we already saw huge differences in incomes and uh, and life expectancy uh, across the city. Uh, huge inequalities still in educational outcomes, despite the massive improvements in education in in London. Um, there are mental health issues, job security uh, issues. Um, huge um, uh, uh, work to be done still on the living conditions, uh, housing and access to green, access to housing and access to green space um, in in the capital. And COVID, you know, didn't create all these problems. It's just highlighted how material these inequalities um, are and they're entrenched in our our society. Um, Factors such as ethnicity and migration status, uh, socioeconomic status, disability, gender, uh, age, all these have, have left groups at much greater risk of job losses um, uh, or, or greater uh, uh, liability uh, to, to, to suffer from uh, poor mental health um, or serious illness, loss of life, obviously. Um, you know, this is within the context of London being really, really hard, hard hit by the pandemic uh, due to our demographics um, and our economic structures. Um, you know, I think it still surprises people to know, uh, to you know, to, to understand that our, our labour market has been the worst hit in the UK. We've had the highest number of job losses, um, uh, our unemployment several percentage points higher in London than it is elsewhere um, in the UK. Largest numbers of the workforce, uh, you know, the highest proportion of, of our workforce um, uh, has been furloughed compared to uh, any other, other region. You know, huge rises in, in universal credit, much higher than any other region in, in the UK. So that's the context. And um, what we've done at City Hall, um, uh, you know, we've absolutely determined, committed to drive a strong recovery uh, for London and, and tackle those deep-seated inequalities um, that COVID has just, uh, you know, highlighted. Uh, and it, as well as exacerbated, but it didn't create all those things. Um, we want our recovery to reshape our city that were, is that's one that's fairer and more equal, um, greener, more eco- economically and socially uh, resilient um, than it was before the pandemic. Um, and we want to do that through uh, supporting thriving town centres, high streets and neighbourhoods. Um, we want to improve wellbeing. Um, uh, access to a strengthened healthcare system. Um, And this is all set out in the programme of the London Recovery Board, uh, which began uh, last July in 2020. And it brought together leaders right across from London's uh, public, private um, and voluntary sector and the community and faith uh, uh, sectors. 
Um, and it's got a grand challenge to restore confidence in the city. Uh, helping London's most vulnerable communities uh, and rebuild the city's economy and society. Um, and all that is uh, underpinned um, by uh, nine recovery missions. Uh, and they've been shaped by exceptional levels of, of public engagement and consultation. Um, and they range from the Green New Deal, uh, helping, to, uh, helping Londoners into good work, uh, building strong communities, um, developing our high streets, high streets for all. Um, and these missions are, are seeking to deliver on, on a set of uh, five outcomes for London's uh, recovery. It's about reversing the pattern of rising unemployment uh, uh, and the, the lost economic growth that we've seen over the last 18 months, uh, narrowing the economic, uh, social and health inequalities that I've, I've talked about, um, helping young people to flourish, supporting our communities, uh, particularly those most impacted by the virus, and also accelerating the delivery of the things that we wanted to see before um, uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic, such as, you know, cleaner, greener London. Um, and a lot of work is, is uh, underway on that, and perhaps we can explore that later um, in the conversation, like the High Streets for All Challenge, um, uh, inviting local partnerships to um, uh, bring recovery strategies for their localities uh, forward. We're just about to uh, announce the successful bids for that. Um, and the £32 million Good Work for All Fund um, that the uh, Mayor is launching as well, helping Londoners develop the skills that they'll need to uh, access jobs in, in the key sectors that we want to see grow uh, going forward. And it won't surprise people to know that list includes the digital, green economy, culture, creative yeah. industries, uh, those areas that are sort of absolutely ripe um, uh, for growth. Um, and whilst there are these actions that we can take now to kind of stimulate a fair recovery, we don't have all the levers we need. I mean, take high streets, uh, the high streets for all, for example. This is about seed money, about helping boroughs explore ideas uh, and develop their own ideas. But it's not actually going to pay for the transformation. Uh, we need to work closely with the government and we need to ensure that London and London and its boroughs really get a, a fair proportion um, uh, of the levelling um, up funding. Uh, but the evidence that we've seen over the last few months suggests that we've got a really real problem there. Um, London only got 2% uh, allocated from the Getting Building Fund, 7% um, of the English High Streets uh, uh, Fund. Uh, you know, however you cut it, the return is far short of, of London's, uh, uh, London's due share. So, um, you know, we're looking looking at the the criteria going forward. You know, no London boroughs are in the seventy three priority local authority areas that the government has set out uh, for the uh, community renewal fund. Uh, and as London councils pointed out in their recent report, um, you know, the nature of these funds mean that funding decisions of as little as half a million pounds are taken on a desk um, in Whitehall under ministerial direction, and, and that can't be uh, the best way forward. Um, I'll, I'll finish up with just. Two pleas, which are the same pleas that I've had um, every time I speak at a conference like this uh, long before uh, COVID. We want to see much more control over funding and powers being passed down. Um, part of the solution has got to be more devolution to local authorities, city regions um, uh, 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 across um, England. It's not looking good in the direction of travel at the moment. I think we hit a bit of a high on, um, on skills funding uh, devolution, but I think we're now entering a period of retrenchment um, um, on, on devolution. Um, and uh, the second uh, of my two final things um, is about infrastructure investment, um, uh, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's uh, general infrastructure, whether it's transport infrastructure, um, we desperately need uh, a, a serious settlement um, in London, as well as uh, the running costs um, of, of the tube need to be uh, need, need to be addressed on a long term sustainable basis. And I think those things are absolutely yeah. vital to create the foundations for a strong recovery. Thank you, Jules. Um, moving on to our uh, next panelist, uh, we've got uh, Lloyd Lee. Lloyd, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why U Capital have chosen to invest in London uh, and what are its amb ambitions for future projects here in London? Sure, absolutely. And uh, apologies for going black and then coming back in a different room. We've, we've literally got two sets of construction on either end of the building. Uh, and of course, the guys who decided to drill were in the wrong room. So I had to move. Uh, so apologies for that. 
Um, in any event, uh, let me give you just a quick background on the level of investment and what we're investing into in London. And everything we do pretty much is in London. Um, at the moment, U Capital uh, and its investors are investing approximately two billion sterling into central London, uh, specifically into the built environment, into real estate. Um, and we support particularly um, as a strategy today, certain key sectors and certain key strategies. Uh, we are very much investing into the creative industries. Uh, we are also investing into the sciences and life sciences and medical particularly. Uh, we also are investing very much into community and social fabric in everything that we do as a house. Um, and we believe that is an important mix of both strategic industrial sectors and strategies that create jobs, employment, long-term growth potential for London and for Londoners and for the country generally, as well as for ensuring that the way that we actually make those investments is also responsible and inclusive so that it captures uh, all of society. Um, and it doesn't just capture a specific percentage of the population. Um, it, it, to give you an example, we are investors, for example, in Olympia in West London, uh, which has very much been focused around supporting and investing into the exhibition business, which is what Olympia has been since 1886. But it's also now become a vision of opening up the exhibition halls in all of the 14 acres of Olympia to the public. Uh, and supporting particularly the creative arts, where we are now um, having announced in the middle of COVID that we are committed to advancing forward and have now started construction on some of the largest live entertainment, music and performing arts venues uh, in, built in the last 50 years in London. Uh, as a statement of our support, we're opening two hotels as a statement of our support, but we are also working very hard to work on building a school for the performing arts for building a community stage, uh, for opening spaces for incubator businesses and young startups in Hammersmith to be able to find a foothold in the borough that they can then use to work collaboratively with some of the larger names in live entertainment and, and in the industry. Uh, and I think for us, the reason that we are investing into London, uh, we think is of particular relevance given this discussion today. If you think about London as a major metropolis in the world, a leading metropolis, arguably the leading metropolis, all big cities have big glass shiny office buildings, fancy hotels. It's not really special. What makes London special from both a real estate perspective, but also from a social perspective is that London, being a city of almost a thousand contiguous years, has a very organic history and heritage to its built environment that is very, very special. It is a mix of old and new. Olympia, built in 1886, we're preserving and cherishing the original Victorian arches and the halls because they are genuinely special. It's not just rip it down, build me a brand new glass office building again. Equally, we think that one of the things that makes London special and particularly attractive from an investment standpoint is that the other reason that people come to London is because you generally see all walks of life. That's, that's cultural, it's international, it's domestic, it's socioeconomic, it's, it's educational, it's backgrounds, it's everything. And one of the things that we find important as an investor into real estate that is an ethos for us uh, has been that in the same way that you cannot forget the forgotten buildings, the ones that haven't been renovated in 30 to 40 years and let them fall by the wayside, you have to pick them up again and reinvest into them. You cannot tear them down. We think the same applies for London society, where as, as Jules was saying, COVID has accelerated some of the apparent issues that we face as London in terms of the haves and the have nots, the job creation and the, and the unemployment. Uh, and as a result, what we're focusing on is ways to invest into those forgotten parts of London physically, but ensure that when we do so, we also can invest into London society where we can broaden the opportunity set so that it actually reaches out in terms of education, in terms of leveling up, in terms of job growth, career growth, long-term plans for people to be able to 
um, look after their families and themselves. Uh, and what we find, and this is what's interesting, what we find is in the same way that people who visit London, do business in London, employ people in London, um, have tourism in London, the same way that they love London for that same unique character we just talked about, we think that when you get the investment right and you broaden the horizon to look after various different members of the public, you also ensure that London's character of people continues to be vibrant and mixed and different and unique so that it's not all just people wearing ties every day to go to work. It's a mix of everyone. And that is something to be cherished. But when you get it right, I think it also adds value to the bottom line equation of your real estate, your values, the economy, the diversity, its resilience, because it has that unique mix relative to many other major metropolises around the world. And that's what we seek to invest in. One of the other investments we just made in September was in Shepherd's Bush Market in West London. Um, basically a 106 year old market with 106 different market traders. And one of the things that we're starting to discover as we meet these individual traders, many of whom are third or fourth generation, is that there is no single voice that speaks for that market. As we've started to get to meet every single market trader and every family and every story personally, there are 106 different voices. The problem is that historically, they've never had an opportunity to speak for themselves before. Many of them really don't speak English. They don't read English very well. They have felt intimidated by the system to be able to have their voice heard. And so we feel it is our obligation to ensure that every single one of those 106 voices is heard. But we are utterly convinced that we, if we invest with the market traders, support their businesses, reinvest into Shepherd's Bush Market and bring it back to its former glory. People will find something to treasure in the market that you cannot find in a brand new shopping mall um, because it's got the character of a 106-year-old market trading environment. And we're very excited about it. It's a lot of hard work, let me tell you. But we think in the end, it will pay dividends for the local economy and for the wider London economy. And it's this kind of thing that makes the UK proud of London. Thank, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, uh, a really passionate uh, uh, case in favour of why London is such a fantastic city to live and work. Um, moving on very quickly uh, to Tony Travers next. Tony's got a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about what the current economic position for London is in comparison to other UK city economies and how can London help support other regions? Tony. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> thanks, Nick, and morning, everybody. Um, first, some of these points will have been touched on <clears throat> already. The event is considering has got a certain amount of traction, but at the moment seems to consist, as uh, Jules and uh, others have uh, you made the point in the past, Nick, of a series of sort of ill thought through grants being scattered around the country um, without quite so much thought being given to the need for better education, which is the thing that would make everything and skills training that would make everything different. And of course, a lot of people within the boundaries of London need that kind of help just as much as they would in Blackpool or in the North East. Uh, it is notable that the unemployment figures published this morning show unemployment encouragingly down to 6.5% in London, but that is well above the average. It's the highest for any nation or region in the UK, <clears throat> leaving us in the slightly odd position of levelling up from the area with the highest level of unemployment in the country to all the others with lower levels of unemployment. That is a, a fascinating Alice in Wonderland idea if ever there was one. So I just think that on a number of fronts, London is going to have to keep pumping out the message that not everybody in the city is rich. Uh, the median, somebody on the median income in London will have a lower standard of living materially than on a median standard on a median income anywhere else in the United Kingdom. It's a 
simple point. You won't be able to buy a home if you're on a median income in London and just hammer those points away. And I think a lot of MPs will begin to get the message. As I've said a hundred times before in Darren's hearing, no doubt, the current drift of public policy you know, is to level up from the rich of Barking and Dagenham to the poor of Harrogate. And you keep making these points because it doesn't make sense to most fair-minded people if you say it. Within London, we just do need to think about the recovery of the central activ activity zone because without that, <clears throat> whole sectors that matter to Britain, including the theatre, uh, creative arts, the rail system actually, and civil aviation will all suffer permanently. And it won't only be central London that suffers from that, it would ripple out to outer London, in fact, to the whole of the United Kingdom. So to conclude, I think um, really what we need to do is to uh, London private sector, government, NGOs, just need to keep reminding politicians of all parties that London matters to the United Kingdom in the way that Jules uh, and Lloyd both uh, suggested. But secondly, that levelling up must include the people of London. It's people levelling up, it should be about, not regions. There are plenty of affluent people in the North East and Northern Ireland and very many deprived people in London. And I think MPs, again, know that. People know that. They're fair-minded. So I just think we need to go on pushing out the messages to get the right message across, which is the accurate picture, and not allow people to live in, in a world of make-believe where they actually come to believe things that aren't true and then base public policy on them. Over. Thank you, Tony. That's really helpful. Don't forget, uh, uh, people can post uh, their questions in the Q&A function for uh, later on in the session. Um, on that very subject of uh, the importance of uh, the central London, we'll move on to uh, uh, Ros Morgan, who can talk a little bit more about just how important central London is in attracting businesses and tourists and about some of the plans Central London has to help recover and grow following COVID. Roz. Thank you, Nick. Um, I don't know about uh, any of the attendees, but I've got lots of questions for everyone that's spoken so far. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave those later, but it's interesting what Tony says, because I met a journalist only last week to challenge him on his role should be to be promoting the truth. Um, and to educate people in terms of this whole levelling up and whatever that's meant to mean anyway. Um, and his answer was, it won't make headline news. Um, he would rather, you know, that we were about to go bust and that will make the headline news. And I says, well, we're pretty close to that from a cultural um, perspective um, and we will lose that at our peril. But back to the question. So I think it's almost impossible uh, to overstate the uniqueness of London and the role it needs to play in, in the UK economy. And it's unique in the nation, as the nation's capital city. It's uh, unique as a global city of talent, culture, commerce, infrastructure. And it's unique in the value that it brings to the UK. And, and, and Jules and, and Lloyd have commented on many of those, but some of the key facts that um, is worth noting is it generates 211 billion in GVA, 5 billion in business rates, it employs 1.9 million people, um, and it's gateway for, you know, global tourists, talent and investment, and it generates billions in surplus tax, which helps the levelling up of communities. And I, I like what Tony says, it's not about the regions, for me, it's about communities. Um, and also, of course, it's a global leader for culture with 80 percent of tourists and that's why they come. So a lot of what Lloyd says, and I was nodding frank fr frantically um, because it's exactly um, what I, I have been saying. Um, but there's no doubt about it. London has been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. The footfall was the hardest hit in the UK. GDP, the hardest hit of the G7 um, economies. Unemployment at its highest, 99% of our businesses are SMEs. Um, and we've something like 700,000 workers have left London to go you know, back to Europe. And then just to give you an idea of the impact of spend, you know, uh, visitor spend, the international spend dropped by 7.4 billion 
domestic spend dropped by 3.5 billion and, and commuter spend dr dropped by 1.9 billion. So, you know, you're talking about very significant figures. And there's two key challenges. The first is the kind of long COVID effect or in, a, in the kind of economic sense. And then it's also how do we rebuild this global competitiveness? And in terms of the first, you know, we were, London was the first in, and frankly, it's going to be the last out. The support measures that London receives ha is, hasn't been and isn't commensurate to the actual cost of doing business in London. Um, and, you know, of course, we need in London, there's this real interdependence of the sectors. Um, we All sectors need to be open, especially where I am in the West End. There's no point in just having retail open or F&B. They're struggling. You know, you know, we try to, to be glass half full. But the reality is until our cultural institutions, including our West End theatres, are full and open without these measures, the economy of the West End and central London will continue to be affected. And the interventions needed are actually really simple. It's government needs to help businesses either save costs or support them with their costs. And in terms of the second point about rebuilding global competitiveness, um, again, very simple points. We need to invest in London. Sounds um, almost too simple, um, but we've commented on it already today in terms of um, the levelling up agenda and the fact that it's more of a political issue rather than an economic issue. But the investment needs to go towards the public transport system, you know, to make sure that it's safe, reliable and affordable and it's fit for purpose for this kind of global 24 hour city. The second piece of investment would be for the global marketing campaign. Um, we need to promote London to visitors and investors and to talent. And to give you a little bit of um, um, relevance, you know, the mayor put forward six million pounds towards a domestic campaign, but that is that verse that's against something like 140 million spent by Singapore, 80 million spent in Hong Kong, 29 million in New York. So we're nowhere near, you know, the kind of spends that actually we need if we are to bounce back. And the last area of investment would be this reskilling of, um, you know, of, of Londoners. Um, I think it's a national issue, but we're really struggling with recruitment um, and employment at the, at the very time that we're actually trying to um, open up. A really interesting fact from London First's report was that we've got £460 million of unspent apprenticeship levy sitting in the Treasury's office. We, that could be put to much better use. Aside from a minute, we want to restore confidence. And frankly, we need the PM to stand up and say, London is open. The mayor is doing it. We need the prime minister to do it as well. We need to remove the barriers. So some of these crazy decisions about tax free shopping being removed, that needs to be reinstated. Simple things like introducing late night trading for our kind of key international zones. Um, and yeah, so just a few few thoughts on um, what's needed if we really want not just London, but the UK to recover at some kind of pace. Left to its own devices, London will recover. But how long that will take is anyone's guess. Um, and so really, I think we ignore London at the country's peril. Thank you, Roz. Um, and from a central uh, London perspective, uh, we move to a, a very different perspective on the city uh, to Councillor Darren Rodwell, leader of Barking and Dagenham Council. Darren, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your perspective uh, on the levelling up agenda and the government's levelling up agenda and perhaps how you might benefit from that and how do you think the rest of London can ensure it has opportunities to benefit from funding and investment? Darren. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, if I can say, first of all, uh, Jules was very good in articulating the situation and other uh, speakers as well. Uh, the truth is, it's about having trust in uh, governance. And there is no trust in governance. The whole levelling up agenda is a political stunt to make the North feel loved um, rather than what we see in London today. Only two boroughs in London, mine and Newham's, are category one out of 123 uh, local authorities, only two in London. Yet Newham and Tower Hamlets have poverty levels slightly better than mine, uh, but I'm the fifth most deprived area in the country. They are not that far behind. So actually, I believe out of 10 areas, 
London has eight of them uh, that are in no sort of numbers. So let's be honest about it. London is the engine room of the, ca- uh, of the country. And until government stops playing politics and actually starts investing in people, we're going to have a real, a real problem. Uh, and, and the levelling up agenda, even for us as a, as a, a, catapult, a category one, uh, is, is a joke. And I say this because Dagnam East is a station that we've been asking now for four years to have investment. Uh, We're talking about £15 million to make it uh, accessible for people with disabilities, to allow C2C to stop there. Why? Because Dagnam East won't be on uh, 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 some of your speakers' radar. But actually, it's the only place in London that has data, science, engineering and media in one location. It's got two billion pounds worth of investment from foreign nationals, shall I say, that we as a local authority has done. But I can't get the government to invest in a little station to help build the investment London needs. We have a real issue that London is still a supernova of, uh, and and it splits rich and poor. What we actually need is London where it's pulsing again to be a network of nodes of different investment across the whole city that actually makes us an even more attractive place to come. And so for me, this isn't about bricks and mortar. It's about bricks and mortar and hearts and minds. What makes London special, what makes us the world's best capital city is our history of people. And unless we invest in those people, we are going to lose our status. And there's nothing the mayor can do about it, but there's everything the government can do about it. So my plea would be stop playing politics, let's invest in people and let the country bounce back as everyone professes they want it to be. Thank you, uh, Darren. Thanks for that. That's a, a really helpful and, and, and uh, an important perspective, which I'm sure will uh, stimulate some uh, Q&A. So we'll move on to the Q- Q&A section and I think I'll take Chair's p- privilege of uh, asking the first question. I come at this as someone who's lived in London for 21 years but is also a northerner as you can tell by my accent and that's not North London, that's Yorkshire. Uh, and uh, you know I feel, I get, I get quite a lot of pressure placed on me by family and friends about you know London gets everything and it's our turn to get some of that. Um, how much of this is about hearts and minds and emotion? Um, and who are our allies in this debate? And how do we find ways of working with them to try and turn this argument? So I turn to the panel. I don't know, uh, maybe Tony, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think... Um... Uh, London's allies should include, and I hinted at this when I was speaking a moment ago, should include um, members of Parliament, including Conservative members of Parliament. The Conservatives, after all, are in power, and they're going to be for some uh, years to come. Uh, They've got a substantial majority. And I don't think, I mean, if you follow the sort of, let's put it kindly, this sort of uh, mood music of the modern Conservative Party, proud in Britain, you know, doing things better post Brexit. I can't see how not having your capital city doing well makes sense. I mean, would it be better uh, for the north of England if Paris were a real success and London weren't? I mean, I don't just don't see Brexit supporting MPs thinking that's a good idea. So I'm afraid some of the arguments that are doing the rounds out there probably have to be flipped around a bit to be presented slightly differently. Paris is going to be building lots of extra railway lines when the government, I'm afraid, the settlement for TFL is not very good. Uh, So I just think that we've got to convince the Conservative backbench MPs that London matters in a number of ways, soft power ways and economically. And the Treasury will get the latter, by the way. So the Treasury is another place to push this. I just don't think if you lose the productivity of inner and central London, which was very high in a country with very poor productivity rates, 
you know, best of luck trying to replace that in the fishing industry, wonderful though that is. So we've got to push these messages in parts of government where they'll hear them, or London does. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Uh, Jules? Yeah, uh, I think that's probably the number one thing. I, I, I agree with Tony. Um, it would be mad to think that, um, uh, that you know, the, the most supportive, uh, go, you know, su- government supporting uh, back venture um, from London um, uh, would uh, would would happily see their own capital city um, on 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 the slide. Um, uh, also, those MPs who would be smart enough to know that uh, that to agree with with what I posited earlier that 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 it's a symbiotic relationship. All parts of the country need to do well. It can't be just at the expense of London. I think another uh, group of um, of, of supporters um, of, of, of our of our position uh, that it would be good to get would be probably the, this audience. In fact, I mean, investors into London um, need uh, to know that the government has confidence and determination, um, uh, as much as we do at City Hall, in in building back better in in London. Uh, and I mean, some practical examples um, will often bring me back to the transport system. You know, London, it's, this isn't about growing London for the sake of it and growing London at the expense of the rest of the country. Bits of London will grow anyway. People want to come and live here. They will come back uh, in, in the same kind of numbers and people will want to invest here and build. Well, if the transport system doesn't support that, then we're going to get bad growth. We can see the potential for that happening in, say, uh, the old Kent Road. Without the Bakerloo line extension, we could see, well, we could see two things. We could either see very bad unsupported growth and people not being able to move around because the bus is already jammed, um, or uh, we can also see uh, developers being put on hold, either by choice by developers or the Grampian conditions that planners are now having to place on buildings, preventing them from being built out until the Bakerloo line extension has been agreed and funded. So we are now actually seeing breaks being put on good growth um, in London. And we need to we need decision makers to realise that. But we need the people who are watching this uh, uh, today to to get on board and help us make that point. Thanks, thanks, Jules. Lloyd, I, I wonder whether you might be able to comment on that from a from a business and investor perspective. Are, are, are investors looking at this debate and worried about future investment decisions because London suddenly isn't going to be getting the attention, focus, and investment that it needs as a global city? I, I would put it this way. I would say that uh, again. If you look at the investment community that invests into London, it is both domestic, UK, and international. Um, And so if you then look at the opportunity to invest that money elsewhere, there is a lot to like about London. There always has been. I think a lot of investors are prepared to take the bet that there always will be, certainly in in any normal investment time horizon, the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, And so I think macro wise, people are going to be bouncing back into investments in London. We are already seeing it. Uh, We ourselves, uh, being UK centric and UK focused, have already done it. Um, But we think that there are more um, investors like us who are coming through the ranks over the next six to 12 months. That being said, um, as I think everyone has said, that, that growth, that return, employment, people liking London is probably widely accepted. The key is then the execution of how well and how broadly that is accepted. Um, And to some of the other more important points that take a longer term view, it cannot just be flash in the pan investments here today, gone tomorrow. I take my profits and I run. You need to invest into infrastructure. You need to invest into people, which means not just people for today. It means education, internship programs, and all of the things that take time, but in the end pay dividends. Um, And so I think one of the messages that government probably needs to say about London is we too, as government, are preparing to invest now with an eye on the long term. So as much as we know that there need to be emergency packages 
furlough, um, for example, is a good example of stuff that needs to be done now. That is what keeps us in the bridge to go across the other side. But once you get to the other side, the investment must be long-term. It must be into the fabric of society. It must be into London long-term and its infrastructure. Um, and I think if government says that we will encourage that kind of private sector investment into those areas and work with you in partnership to do that, obviously in real estate, working with local communities, local boroughs, local planning authorities is hugely important, um, both at the individual local level and at the GLI level. Um, and we do that quite a lot. Um, I think that those messages will be heard by the private sector and encourage them to come back for more and invest more. Thanks. That's really helpful. Uh, Roz or Darren, is there anything you want to add on this particular question? Yeah. Um, only apart from the politicians um, and investors, I think also our visitors have a, have a role to play too. And I think naturally as the demand grows, um, you know, then the supply will have to keep up. It's just a bit of a concern and a bit alarming that we almost will need to get to breaking point before an investment will go into to TFL. And I think that we all, like Jewel say, have has a role, we have a role to play in putting that case forward. And I think we shouldn't take anything for granted. Like many people on this call, I've been speaking to politicians, MPs, um, secretaries, all during this crisis. And I have to say, on occasions, I've been alarmed at how, how little they know about um, the, the role that London plays in terms of, of, of the um, recovery of, of the UK. And either they don't know or they're willfully ignoring it. And I think that that's a huge risk. Um, but ultimately, I think what we're basically saying here, isn't it, is that we need a dedicated recovery plan that is business led. I mean, Lloyd, you know, you sold London to me within the space of a couple of minutes and I already love London, but you sold it to me again. Um, and so it's really important that whatever this recovery plan looks like, I know, Jules, we've got one for London through the mayor's office, but we're talking about the national recovery um, it definitely needs to have that business-led um, approach. Thank you, Ros. Darren, would you like to add anything from your perspective? All recoveries have to be people-led. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's the visitors to this great city, whether it's the people that uh, are the infrastructure. And uh, that it all starts with investment. I, I have to say that um, the city itself... Uh, will recover. Uh, Lloyd is absolutely right. What we need to do, though, is have a decision by government. Either they let London lead its own recovery or it invests in that recovery directly. It's one or other. Yeah. But we need all sectors of London to come together because what's really clear is the mayor will not win the battle alone. He needs local government of all uh, backgrounds to be supportive. He needs the private sector to be supportive. He needs the communities to be supportive. And um, that goes for the TfL debacle. Let's be frank about it. It's been used as a political football to attack the mayor on running up to his mayoral election. Well, that's all right, but that's schoolboy politics. That's playground politics. Can we have some adults in the room now to start talking about how we are going to get proper investment back into the capital city that allows areas like mine to build the 50,000 homes, by the way, the size of York, to bring the free markets to London, to bring the world class data science engineering, to actually make the change happen. And let's not forget the only women's museum in England and Wales. You know, we are serious about our culture, we are serious about investment. If government wants to be serious about it, leave it to the adults in the room. Collectively, we can make that change. Thanks, Darren, it's really helpful. I'm gonna use a question from uh, Lisa Taylor in the Q&A, slightly uh, um, uh, uh, amend it if uh, Lisa's okay with that. So Lisa asked a really important question, you know, how are we gonna pay for many of the things that the city needs many of which are co complex and there's often conflict in priorities you know creating a greener and more equal fairer city creating workspaces for businesses etc when councils and the gla have had such brutal budget cuts 
and central government uh, seemingly don't want to help or contribute. Are there other ways of finding the investment that we need? Uh, and uh, Lisa specifically poses a question to Lloyd, is there an appetite from developers and investors to foot the bill for the socioeconomic as well as the built outputs? So, so I would say that as a house, over the last 3 million square feet worth of investment in central London in the last 11 years, one of the things that we have discovered about investing into socially inclusive plans is that it's it does pay dividends, but you have to have conviction and you have to do it right. You cannot just throw money at a problem because you just wasted money then if you've thrown it at a problem. But if you actually build proper infrastructure, schools, programs, theater spaces, community spaces, and then you actually work with great local people to make sure they're run well, it has to be done all the way. Again, you can't just say there's a box, have at it. It's got to be run properly. What happens is that the private sector that looks at that location goes, you know what? That speaks to who I am as a company. That's where my people want to go work. That's where actually my employees might want to live. Um, that's where we want to go to do our conferences, to, to go for a drink or whatever. And what happens is you then actually find that the private side of your equation is actually benefiting from the fact that you've invested into the social fabric to be more inclusive. It's a very intricate formula. You have to take the stand and take the position to do it. But in our experience, going back again, 3 million square feet, and, and you know, one of our very first projects was actually the failed Greenwich Hospital site that was derelict and torn down for almost a decade. Um, and we made the commitment to build 50% on-site affordable 11 years ago, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, when no one else was really talking about that level of scale, 650 homes, 50% on-site plus the Greenwich Community Center and the primary care trust unit and the public library. But, but today, other than COVID, the Greenwich Community Center gets a million visitors a year. It's got a square, it's got a farmer's market. People live there, real families grow up there. And what happens? Property values have done well in that whole area. Retail stores have opened, new businesses have opened because of that way of investing, as opposed to we sold it all to offshore private investors. Nobody lives there. The lights are out at six o'clock in the winter time, but we got out, we sold it all, all private. Um, and that for us is a commitment that the private sector can make, um, needs to make, government needs to support them in making it. And the private sector does need to open its eyes and be willing to make that extra leap of a lot of hard work to do it that way and do it properly. But we think that if you do, it will pay private sector investment dividends, and it will continue to make London that leading city in the world, which is what makes London great in the first place. Thanks, Lloyd. So that's really helpful. I think Lisa's a member of your fan club uh, looking at the uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, Tony, how is London going to pay for the things that it needs if government's not prepared to open the purse to help us? Well, I think Lisa's question is really interesting and Lloyd's response too, because it, it hints at what a, 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 a classic potential unintended consequence. Because if the government sends out the message, which it is a bit at the moment, that it'll invest anywhere other than London, you know, as if England was now two countries, London where nothing is, you know, we're not going to invest much, the rest of the country where we will, particularly in the Midlands and the North. It's hard to imagine that that won't lead councils and city hall with a position where they have to ramp up development and development densities to pay for more. Because why not lighten up on the planning system, get developers to pay for more? And that, of course, uh, you know, will create I mean, the, the best example. And I'm definitely not having a go at the developers on this occasion, but look at Battersea Nine Elms. Uh, where you can make a development, pay for a tube station, rebuilding a power station, a whole load of other good things, but it does end up looking big. 
And it's not the developer's fault. That's the way the system works. So I think that the government will probably trigger a more liberal planning system in London, higher levels of development density, which will help London even more. But I'm not sure it'd be great for the skyline. I'm not sure it'll be great for the built form. And I just don't think, you know, I'm, I'm always intrigued by consequences. This looks like a pretty inevitable one. Thanks, Tony. It's really helpful. Jules, you, you, you led a local authority for a long time in London, and now you're the guardian of the London plan. Uh, do you share Tony's uh, view on that? Yes. Um, I mean, many in this audience probably have heard me say this before, that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, obviously, uh, along with the mayor, very keen to extract as much affordable housing as possible out of, out of any development. We need it um, in, in London. Um, but it can be uh, a fraught process, um, particularly through viability. And often that affordable housing is competing with an awful lot of infrastructure um, that is uh, sort of a, 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 a requirement to make the development acceptable in any circumstances. Um, and I think Nine Elms, Bassey Nine Elms is a very good example that not only is there a massive amount of height, um, uh, uh, um, and, and density, uh, but also insufficient affordable housing as well. You know, there, there is only so much um, you can you can I I extract, um, and uh, and and say if if uh, so, so as I say, I, I I'm not. This isn't a a, a, a bid to, to let developers off off the hook for what is 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 due planning gain. Um, but uh, there, there, there is only so much um, in, in the pot, uh, often in these circumstances, uh, to go around, particularly in, in, in single development. So it's some, something that's broader and wider, um, then that's usually you know, more scope, but as we can see from Batsy Nine Elms, there, there, there are limits. I think Hackney was lucky that um, uh, it was a particular time when there were uh, developable places that trajectory of, um, of returns um, was uh, definitely up um, and there was an opportunity to, 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 to recycle that. Plus, there was some forward thinking on things like the East London Line extension, improving the North London Line, which, you know, all helped to tra transform the area. I think crucially, though, touching on planning, one of the most important things is about, and, and this speaks, I think, to what Lloyd was saying, is that it's about curation of place. And it's not only money. Mm. Uh, the worrying thing about the government's proposals that Tony touched on um, is that they remove um, a lot or potentially a lot of the powers to be able to curate better places. It's fine if you've got a developer, a large developer with a large area that is under single ownership, and then they can do exactly what Lloyd is saying. But often, regeneration, it's piecemeal ownership, and it needs a custodian of place to be able to bring all the actors together, help marshal the funds, going back to the original question, uh, from different places to make regeneration work as well as, as Lloyd described. But unfortunately, permitted development rights drives the coach and horses through the ability of local authorities to be that rightful curator of place. Thanks, Jules. I'm sure uh, the new levelling up agenda isn't uh, a see-through floating swimming pool for every community in London, like uh, Battersea and Nine Elms have. But we're right up against time now, so I'd really like to just ask one final question to all the panellists, and I want a one-word answer from them all. Um, so you need to be very succinct. What do you think is the most important thing London can do to support the wider UK recovery? Uh, and I'll start with Ros. Can't do it in one word. I think the question should be, what should government do, not what should London do? And so the simple answer is put petty politics aside and invest in London. A two billion pound investment over three years would get at least a return of about 25 to um, 35 billion. It's easy. The, 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 the um, figures speak for themselves. Right. Thank you, Ros. Lloyd. Agreed. I think we need to invest and we need to invest with a long-term mentality into the fabric of London. Darren. 
I think we need to do both of what the two other panellists said, but also remember people are the heart, breathing soul of London and invest in those people. The infrastructure of homes, the, the need for soft infrastructure, schools, so on and so forth. But most importantly, make people feel valued because at the moment, London feels like it's second class uh, to what the government wants on its agenda. Tony. Well, I think uh, London, both the boroughs and the mayor, need to keep on working with their colleagues in the rest of sub-national government in England, uh, lobbying for more decisions about more money and investment to be made in people's own areas. I mean, the at the moment, not only are things being decided by a few civil servants in Whitehall, right, for the whole of the country, but, you know, they're from the homes of the people in Whitehall right across the country, and that's not a great way of doing it. So joint efforts to uh, deliver devolution. Thanks, Tony. Jules. As a veteran of both of Tony's London Finance Commissions, I can only agree uh, with uh, with what Tony said. But I, I, on top of that, everyone in London coming together, all the sectors, uh, to, to uh, agree on a common narrative to convince the government. Because, you know, London's government is not funded to be a, a delivery agent in the way that we, we need. It's a strategic authority. So all we can do is, uh, is bring people uh, together and make the case uh, for, for London. Or, going back to Tony's point, let's have devolution and then we will have the money to be able to make uh, these interventions ourselves rather than constantly having to ask the government. Well, we could have continued with this debate, I think, for many hours, uh, given uh, uh, how passionate people are about London and the levelling up agenda. But I just want to say thank you to our panellists today for a really good discussion. Thank you for those of you who've been watching and contributing questions. Uh, and I hope that you will enjoy the uh, rest of the uh, uh, events over the coming days. And I'll hand now back to Bonnie. Thank you, Nick. And thank you so much to our panel for a great discussion. And as you said, a really passionate London keynote. And thank you, Capital, for your support of the session. And um, looking ahead, audience, we'd be delighted to see you tuning in to some of our other sessions today. Details of what's coming up are now on your screen. We have our Healthy Places keynote starting immediately. Um, a panel discussing the future of Kingston, so another London borough, if London is your focus of interest. Um, a session with the Department of International Trade's Regional Investment Team promoting inland investment opportunities. Uh, an innovative online networking session with Reba and a discussion on the latest planning reforms with Merchantland, Commonplace and the BPF. So lots of other sessions to enjoy today. Hope to see you again at some of those. Um, and yeah, if not later on in the week, thank you for joining the London keynote and we will see you soon. Mm -hmm.